This programming is brought to you by the Greater Houston Partnership. Since 1840, engaging business leaders from 900 member companies across 12 area counties. More about membership at Houston.org. The Greater Houston region is trending towards record level hospitalizations due to COVID. Just how soon could that be? I'm Joshua Zinn, in for Craig Cohen, and today on Houston Matters, Dr. David Callender from the Memorial Hermann Hospital System joins us to share the latest from their hospitals. Also this hour, we welcome your questions for Houston City Council member Carolyn Evans Shabazz. You can send those now to talk at HoustonMatters.org or tweet at Houston Matters. Also ahead, before the days of social media, if you wanted to comment about news stories, you'd have to send in a letter to the editor. These days, you can comment on just about anything you want. Is there value to this for media organizations? We revisit the subject in a conversation from 2019. Plus, we'll also revisit a segment on the history of air conditioning in Houston. We'll start with a news update from NPR and News 88.7. Stay with us. This is Houston Matters. I'm Joshua Zinn in today for Craig Cohen. Good morning. Later this hour, we'll take your questions for Houston City Council member Dr. Carolyn Evans Shabazz, but you can send them to us now at talk at HoustonMatters.org. Then, how can social media spark more meaningful public discussion? But first, the Texas Medical Center has reported a new record in average daily hospitalizations due to COVID 19. The previous high was set in July of 2020 with 360. Uh, average daily hospitalizations, and now we're at 369 daily hospitalizations as of last week. Vaccines for the virus have been widely available for months, yet Houston hospitals are seeing the largest surge in cases yet. To help us understand what this means for area hospitals and healthcare providers, Dr. David Callender joins us now. He's the president and CEO of the Memorial Hermann Hospital System. Dr. Callender, welcome back to Houston Matters. Good morning, Joshua. Thank you. Uh, How are COVID hospitalizations at your system looking now and over the weekend? Well, we're very busy right now. We have been for a number of weeks. I think the situation is relatively dire. We're not yet out of capacity, but patients who are arriving at our outpatient centers, at our hospitals, at our emergency departments, are waiting for care because we're so busy, it's just taking time to get to people. And so that always makes us concerned that people who need to get in to be seen particularly quickly may have delays in terms of us being able to provide appropriate care. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the trends are are kind of, you know, showing increases in, in various metrics. Is this a pretty significant change from compared to last month? Well, absolutely. You know, back uh, around the 1st of July, we thought things looked pretty good, although we were concerned about Delta. And suddenly we began moving into this, what we now call the fourth wave or fourth peak. And uh, it continues to go up. At least the slope of the line is going up. So it's concerning. We're not exactly sure when it's going to top out plateau and, and start to move in a better direction. Do we know what percentage of COVID hospitalizations are fully vaccinated people? It's a very small percentage. For us across our system, looking at all people coming in, it's less than 5% being fully vaccinated who are presenting for hospitalization. As we've said all along, this has predominantly become a pandemic of the unvaccinated, at least in terms of severe illness and the need for hospitalization. So we're really talking about the unvaccinated people coming into the hospital with COVID. Health officials across the country are stressing that the Delta variant is affecting younger people as well. They say the average age of hospitalizations has now dropped to between 30 and 40 years of age. What are we seeing uh, here in this area as as far as the, the age of those hospitalized? That's true here also, Uh, certainly true across Memorial Hermann. The average age of hospitalization now is mid-30s. If we look by decade at people in the hospital, the greatest numbers by far are between 20 and 40. That represents somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of all COVID hospitalizations. So this myth that COVID doesn't impact the young is exactly that. That's untrue. And as we potentially approach that new high point in hospitalizations, you had referred to capacity earlier. Do you have any concerns about the area's ability to handle that increasing capacity need? 
Yeah, well, already we're very busy. And as I said earlier, we're concerned. You know, people who need to get in to see us may have difficulty getting in to see us. We also know that when situations uh, like this one occur, then people stay away from hospitals. They stay at home, and typically that results in worsening of illness, greater numbers of problems, or greater severity of problems. So it's not a good situation for Houstonians right now. Right. Well, and, and what is there any practical advice you can share for people who, who find themselves you know, getting sick, and, and but knowing that if I go to a hospital, I'm probably going to have to sit and wait? What, what can people do at this point? I wish I had good options. I, I think the, you know the burden is really on all the rest of us. Let's wear our mask. For those of you who have been unvaccinated, please help us. Please help us stop the spread of this disease. Consider being vaccinated. Speak to an expert, either a healthcare provider or a public health official about it. Let us help you work through your concerns. So right now, it really is about getting control of the pandemic and getting things going in a better direction. Memorial Hermann was the third local health system to implement a vaccination mandate for employees. You announced the deadline is October 9th. Have you had any pushback from employees on that? Not much. I mean, I think people understand what's happening. We certainly have people who still have concerns. But as I just mentioned, we now have the opportunity to sit down with them, to work through those concerns on an individual basis. And we're actually seeing a number of those people who previously haven't wanted to be vaccinated come forward and register to be vaccinated or make a plan to be vaccinated. So we're making progress. Yeah, well, and, and I, I wanted to also bring that up, the, the, that vaccinations sort of have also been trending upwards. It are, is it enough, though, to, to really curb what we're seeing happening in the hospitals right now? Not right now. We really would like to see more people come forward. We certainly have seen an uptick with this arrival of Delta and particularly the realization that, oh my gosh, young people aren't protected by age. But uh, we're still far away from our target of trying to get 80 to 85 percent of the overall population vaccinated. Over the weekend, the Texas Supreme Court issued a temporary stay that halted mask mandates in Bayer and Dallas counties. Harris County filed its own lawsuit late last week on similar grounds, arguing that Governor Greg Abbott cannot issue an executive order banning those mandates in the state. The court still has to issue a final ruling on these cases. But what's your reaction to this sort of constant back and forth battle? battle between state and local leaders over these mandates at a time where hospitals like yours are dealing with these increasing records and increasing daily uh, average hospitalizations? Well, it's extremely unfortunate. You know, when I walk through our emergency rooms, our COVID um, units in our hospitals, I see those horrible expressions of pain, of anxiety on the faces of the patients, particularly the young ones. I see the frustration and the pain in our caregivers. We know that this disease is preventable. We can certainly slow it down with masking and social distancing, and we can stop it with vaccination. So my message right now to the politicians is just stop it. Let's, do, let's work together to stop this pandemic and stop people from having to come into the hospital, putting people at risk all across our state stop people from dying unnecessarily. This is, of course, a stressful time for everyone, and I imagine it's doubly so for hospital staff and other healthcare workers. Uh, as the head of a major hospital system, what are you communicating to your staff amid these circumstances? Well, right now, you know, we're doing the best that we can. Uh, we all continue to share information, share ideas. We're using the full capacity of our system to try it up offer um, services at something akin to a normal level. It's just impossible to do that right now. We all know that we can get through this. We're just going to have to continue to stick together and work to get to the other side of this surge. Dr. David Callender is the president and CEO of the Memorial Hermann Hospital System. Dr. Callender, thanks very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Up next, we're taking your questions for Dr. Carolyn Evans-Shabazz. She's the Houston City Council member representing District D. Send those questions our way at talk at houstonmatters.org, or you can give us a call at 713-440-8870 as Houston Matters continues.
This is Houston Matters. I'm Joshua Zinn, in today for Craig Cohen. Every Tuesday, we like to give you the chance to talk with an area elected official. Today, we welcome back Houston City Council member Dr. Carolyn Evans Shabazz. She represents District D in the city of Houston, which includes the Third Ward, as well as the Texas Medical Center and neighborhoods in South Houston, like Sunnyside and others near the Hobby area. Dr. Evans Shabazz, good morning. Good morning, Joshua. So great to be with you this morning. Well, thank you for joining us. And if you've got questions about things happening in District D or otherwise in the city of Houston, we'd love to hear from you at 713-440-8870 on Twitter at Houston Matters, or you can email us at talk at HoustonMatters.org. Dr. Evan Shabazz, last week, Houston City Council considered a proposed ballot measure for voters that would make it easier for council members to put items on the agenda. In a unanimous vote, the council decided to delay this proposal until the 2023 election, and this decision was just upheld by the Texas Supreme Court yesterday. What is the reasoning behind delaying this measure so long? Well, um, first and foremost, of course, we're looking at budget concerns. Um, I believe to put that single item on the ballot is like $1.3 million. And certainly uh, in the times that we're in now, we can certainly use that money in other places. We also, of course, approved a more money to our district service funds, and hopefully that will come down the pike because that helps us to actually help individuals. Of course, you know, I have so much respect for what the voters want, but I certainly would like for this administration to complete um, their term under the current um uh, way of doing things, the the current ordinance. And I would have no objections if we could put it on the ballot and certainly um, have an amendment to put it at the end. But I think that that would have impacted the the ordinance itself, well, the petition itself. And so certainly uh, I believe that, you know, we will have more of a turnout uh, at a municipal election, which will be in 2023. And the voters can certainly, certainly weigh in at that point. Uh, so that we can uh, move forward with whatever they come up with in terms of the uh, ballots and the election uh, process. And what about the proposal itself in the ballot? Do you support that proposal? I actually, I will say this, I do well now with its current, um, the way we currently operate, but certainly I could see the value in it if we can do it, but I can also see the drawbacks Um, You know, I was formerly the chairman of the board of the Houston Community College, and I think that our resources are better when we have a head that can focus on what is needed, as well as a head that listens. Now, if it gets to a point where we have leadership that does not listen to the district and the uh, at-large council members, then I think it would certainly be of value, but currently I don't see it, and I do believe that we can avoid a lot of chaos if we have a head, because, you know, we have our our, our resources to uh, help us to get these items on the agenda. So if we are just, you know, exhausting the people that are helping us to do the background and those things that are needed, then it can be detrimental to the operations of the city government. Yeah, well, we got a a, a question slash sort of response, a comment on Twitter um, that I just wanted to get your input on. Uh, Ian said uh, he lives in your district, wanted to know why you voted to delay the ballot measure. And he continued saying, um, in his words, pushing this vote back for years is undemocratic and angers me because I have seen how little power council council members have to get anything done that isn't in line with the mayor's interests. What's your reaction to to that uh, comment from Ian? Well, I I actually can't speak to that because I have uh, been able to get everything at this point that I have asked of the mayor. Uh, He's certainly been very cooperative. So, you know, I think that people believe that that is the way, but I think that he has a very good uh, rapport with all the council members, and I haven't heard anyone, and that's, that's honest. I haven't heard anyone say that they wanted to get something on the agenda, and they didn't. Now, there is a mechanism, of course, where three council members can get agenda items in a special meeting. And so I believe that if that is uh, the impetus of a particular council member to get something on the agenda that the mayor has resisted, there is a way to do that. 
you know, of course, uh, you know, you have to have quorum at those meetings, but certainly you also have to have nine votes. And so I believe if you have nine people who are in line with what you want to do, which is what you're going to need anyway, then you go and you use that mechanism. So it's not like there's nothing that can be done to get an item on the agenda. And I think people don't really realize that, that there's already a mechanism in place to be able to get that done. And uh, this proposal was submitted by a petition uh, to to people outside of of City Hall. Um, How do you respond to the petitioners who are understandably frustrated by the delay on this measure? Well, I just would respond to say that, you know, we waited. And, you know, we have so many things that are going on uh, fiscally that I would hope that we could use that money to help the, the constituents and not just with a, with a ballot item that's really uh, something that's going to have to be implemented at some point, but certainly, I mean, if it's passed by the voters. Uh, you know, but I do want the voters to understand that having a head uh, as it is with your own body and your own brain is always good to have a head. And so I, uh, I'm not going to weigh in one way or the other. I really want those that are going to run for mayor to weigh in as to how they feel about it. I think everybody on the council is very mindful and very respectful of what the voters want. But at the same time, the ordinance didn't say that we needed to do it at this particular juncture. And so I believe that in the next two years, if someone uh, or some organization really wants to push for that, then certainly I think they would even have a better opportunity to get it done rather than trying to put it and rush it on this particular uh, election cycle. This is Houston Matters. I'm Joshua Zinn. We're talking with Houston City Council member Dr. Carolyn Evans Shabazz. She represents District D, including the third ward. We welcome your questions and comments at talk at HoustonMatters.org or 713 440 8870. Dr. Carolyn Evans Shabazz, there's been quite a bit of back and forth between state and local officials on the topic of mask mandates related to the COVID 19 pandemic. What is your reaction to all that's been going on with this? Well, certainly, uh, as the previous caller mentioned, we are certainly in a crisis situation. And at some point, and certainly not just in regards to mass mandates, I would like to see the people put first in regards to their health. And, you know, it's, it's amazing to me how there's nothing on the legislative agenda which addresses Medicaid expansion, which certainly could help the people to be able to uh, navigate this process because a lot of people don't have health care. And so uh, I'm, I'm just really taken aback by it because, you know, I'm, I'm not one of what, what, what amazes me is that people just don't do it. That, that's what amazes me because when we get sick, we go to the doctor That's basically what we do if we have the resources to do that. And now we don't believe the doctors. We don't believe the science. But yet, you know, we're hearing of people that are on their uh, deathbed, unfortunately, and now they want to take the vaccine. And so I just, it just uh, amazes me how, you know, when we had polio, people had the polio uh, virus, you know, there were mandates to do certain things. But now, of course, you know, people are saying, oh, I don't want the government telling me what to do. Well, basically, every day the government tells you what to do. When you get in a car, you put on your seatbelt and you do it automatically. You strap up yourself. You strap up your children. You put those that are needed in booster seats. And so and you don't really think about it. And of course, the worst consequences are not just to get a ticket. It's to get in an accident. And so the government stepped in at that point and made a decision what was best for the people. Because, you know, at that point, they wanted to keep the people safe. So I look at that and I say, well, if you wanted to keep the people safe and they're in the case of an accident, why not want to keep the people safe with this uh, tremendous pandemic that is going on? And so, you know, I believe local officials are, are closer to the problem. They're seeing the deaths of people. Their hospitals, uh, are overflowing or, or even not able to take patients. So I think that the gov- governor really needs to be more mindful and more respectful of local officials. 
Is there anything specific happening in your district related to limiting the spread of COVID-19, whether through encouraging vaccinations for the community or, or any other measures that are being taken? Well, certainly I am putting it out there, you know, uh, in third ward, we certainly have the Texas Southern University, which is open Monday through Friday still from nine to four. And I am certainly encouraging people to go. I had the, uh, I have a, a longtime friendship with George Floyd's sister, Latanya, and I actually took her there and she got her shots. Uh, she, now she's fully vaccinated. And so, you know, I'm just asking people to tell other people, these are things that you do in love, not, not things that you're trying to take control of people's lives. But the truth of the matter is, if people don't mask up and, and get vaccinated, this virus is going to continue to mutate, which is what has happened now that we, we have the Delta. And so do you want to live like this? And, and because actually, if it continues to mutate, you'll have to get vaccinations frequently, you know, maybe every six months or so. And so certainly at some point, then the vaccine may not work. And then we're totally at the mercy of the virus. So I just want people to be mindful that, you know, by not masking up and by not vaccinating, we are certainly, certainly going to see this vaccine continue to mutate. I mean, excuse me, this virus continue to mutate. And so I, I would just hope, you know, that people will look at it and uh, realize, you know, you and now it came out originally that this was an old people's disease. Nobody got that but old people. But now the numbers show that a lot of people are under 50 and certainly our children, our children are being impacted. And so, you know, sometimes we have to come out of ourselves and be able to be human beings that are looking out for other people. And so I think that that's what more this is about, uh, being able, you know, normally people reach out to help others. So I would like for people to look at it and say, you know, let me examine myself. It may not help me, so to speak, because maybe I'm not susceptible to the virus, though I don't know who that is. Because, of course, you know, the common cold is something that we certainly cannot avoid. But fortunately, it, it normally does not, you know, turn out to be deadly. But we have something deadly. And so I just say I don't want to go into a, uh, a say, a gunfight without a weapon. And so I hope people will, you know, kind of look at it and say, you know, I'm going to go on and get this shot so I can help my neighbors, so I can help my neighbor's children, so I can help the elderly, so I can help others. Because Houston is a strong giving city. So sometimes it goes beyond just giving water and uh, money to things. Sometimes it means we make personal sacrifices to be able to help others. Let's take a call. We've got Kevin uh, calling from the north side. Kevin, what's your question or comment? Yes, thank you for taking my call. So, um, you know, I was listening to uh, the, uh, the councilwoman's uh, response as it relates to the uh, ballot initiative. And I, I just thought it was interesting because, um, you know, if from my understanding, um, it was over 40,000 signatures, I believe, that, uh, that called for this, this um petition uh, they got all the signatures signed so but and, and i was listening to what she was saying as far as the relationship that she was having with the mayor which is great to have that relationship where all of the city councilmen can get along with the with the mayor but i think it's important to realize that if if the, the if the constituents have an issue it goes through the city council person and then it goes to the mayor so it's it's obviously a disconnect and it was proven when uh, when we voted on Prop B, and Prop B passed, the city council and the mayor said, the citizens, we don't know what we want, you know? And now we're saying, okay, I want this ballot initiative to go forth, and I'm hearing the city council woman say, well, we need to ask the new mayor, and we need to make sure that all of the city council people are in agreement with it first, but that's not what the constituents are wanting. So it just seems to me that this administration is telling the is telling us as a constituent what we need, not listening to us as our representatives in office. You understand what I'm saying? I do. And first, first off, Kevin, I don't take into a side question. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, um, 
you know, I certainly understand what you're saying, and I don't think that the council wants to be disrespectful, but we also don't want chaos. And so certainly we are assuming that that would pass. But let me let me kind of, I don't want to say correct you on something, but let me redirect you on something. When constituents come to council members, we do not have to go to the mayor to get these things resolved. We resolve them in our, in our respective offices. So it's not like he has this hands-on telling us day by day how we operate as council members. You know, I get complaints, um, inundated with complaints. Um, daily, you know, particularly, Lord, and I wish people would help us with this dumping uh, and this trash pickup, and, and that's really a problem. But trust me, I the only time I would go to the mayor on something of that nature is if I wanted him to provide additional help for the district to get this done, and he has done that. He has actually uh, contracted uh, with companies to come out and help with uh, the trash pickup and the dumping and all of that. So it's not like he's running these daily offices and these uh, council members on a regular basis. And so we're only talking about initiatives generally that, that cover the full city uh, there, you know, where the mayor generally puts out a, um, puts something on the agenda. And, and so certainly, as I said, you know, the mayor has operated um, with him being the, the the person that puts the items on the agenda, you know, for all of his term. And so certainly I would like to, to finish that out because I don't want us to miss anything and any gaps in services and agenda items. And so, again, I think that we all respect the fact that the constituents, which is why it's going to go on the ballot. But certainly, you know, we have uh, water bills and certain things that are coming up and things that are going to have to be addressed with the money in the general fund. And so I would like to see that money in the general fund go to actually help constituents and not to just put an, an, a, an item on the agenda. And then at the point that we put the item on the agenda, it will very probably have other items, um, such as, you know, what's going on. Um, well, of course, the municipal uh, races will be at that time. And then people can, can actually come out as they generally do in a municipal election. If we have this on a, an election now, I do believe, you know, the voter turnout would be pretty low, and we may not even get those 40,000, uh, you know, that they say sign this petition and so certainly i hope that you know people can see that it, it, it is better to have it when people are going to come and it's more fiscally sound to have it when you have other items on the agenda 1.3 million is a lot of money that could go uh, to help dr people. dr evans shabazz we actually um are just running out of time right now i'm sorry to okay. sorry to cut you off but thank you so well, much for joining you. us thank you kevin and if you want to engage further just reach out to my office and I certainly would love to talk to you uh, regarding this because I do respect the suggestions of others. How can social media spark more meaningful public discussion? Stay with us as Houston Matters continues. This is Houston Matters. I'm Joshua Zinn. Today, you can comment on just about every news story that you see online. So how can media cut through the noise and spur more meaningful public discussion? This is something I talked about with Lindita Samai, an associate professor of communication at the University of Houston back in 2019, about how we interact with media and behave online. When we talk about the evolution of news media, sometimes we tend to speak with nostalgia. But the problem with that process, in my view, was it was a one-way conversation, right? There was no interaction there. You had uh, the viewers who would send those letters who might or might not be read online or in different platforms or discussed or published, right? Might or might not be published. So it was a bit tricky for that reason that it was a selective process, right? And nothing wrong with it. But the issue is that sometimes it really did not get a response back, right? It was a one-way conversation. So what the new technologies have done is created environments for two-way conversations, two-way communication between the news media and the audiences. 
Now, had the news media taken advantage of this? I'm not so sure they have, but there's potential to do so. And the research tells us that if the news media engage in two-way conversations, then these conversations can produce some meaningful discussions. Um, so what we saw happening, especially during the 90s, beginning of, of 2000s, right, with um, Web 2.0 and, and these kind of new technologies that allowed for two-way conversations was lots of news media would open up their discussion sections under their articles, and they would just let people come and, and talk there whatever they wanted. It sounded very democratic. Everybody had a voice. Everybody had a channel to, to voice them. But they were not really engaging much in those discussions themselves. It was still a one-way almost conversation, right? So what I'm saying is it's important, and, and research again shows this, that it's important for news media to use these new technologies to meaningfully engage the readers in a two-way conversation. We've seen that some of this happening, especially as news media started seeing an oops, those conversations are becoming uncivil, flaming, not really what we expected them to be. So they They've been starting to pay attention more to them in terms of moderation. And again, this might sound like censorship in a way, but it's mostly really trying to moderate the conversation that is channeled in a way. So we've seen some of that happening, but in my view, not enough, where journalists or editors get on those platforms, discuss these issues with the, with the, with the readers. And you talked about this aspect that, you know, a letter to the editor is a one-sided thing. And even when somebody comments on a, a web page, for an article that's still very one-sided. But then you also open up the gates where when one person comments, another person can see that comment and mm -hmm. respond to that comment. And mm -hmm. so the readers or the viewers or the listeners can all comment together and that can create this issue where when people are behind a screen and behind a, a little mm -hmm. username, they have mm -hmm. they feel like they have anonymity. People can be a little bit more uncivil and they can say sure. rude things and insulting things. Is there a way to also consolidate that aspect of it as well, where everyone can see what this person says, mm -hmm. but this may also lead to a big flame war in the comment sure. section? Sure, and I think this is what has happened after some research actually was showing that lots of these comments happening under the news stories were really not producing the type of discussions that are optimal for sort of some sort of democratic value, right? They were really all very incivil and lots of inflammatory language there. So what some news organizations have done is they were completely cut off these comment sections and they have instead translated these discussions on the social media. So what we know that has happened with social media, especially Facebook as a platform, is that there's no space more for anonymity there. You need to identify who you are with a name and last name, and there's a verification process. Therefore, on social media, that level of anonymity, especially on Facebook, kind of takes it away, which then I think at the same time makes it that these conversations are more transparent. And once you know that your name is associated with certain comments and you are more careful and more more thoughtful about what you're going to comment and discuss on those platforms, and especially they are public. So I think for that reason, lots of news organizations did that, just really immigrated those discussions on social media platforms. Again, there have been lots of fears that, well, this is this the best platform? Because we know that social media tend to be create what's called these echo chambers. We know that lots of people want to speak to like-minded people. They will not go and really engage in meaningful discussions with people they disagree with necessarily. So it has created all of these kind of fears that, oh, well, there's another level of issues that we need to discuss. What my own research suggests and, and lots of other of my colleagues is that as long as these discussions on, be it on social media or on other platforms are, first of all, moderated, you need to have somebody there who is keeping people on track. If you want your audiences to discuss a certain topic you reported on, it's important that those discussions are on topic, first of all, right? Second, if you want audiences to have meaningful conversations, you want to make sure that they are rational. And then, of course, civil. You cannot have a rational discussion with somebody who's been uncivil. So have an environment in which everybody feels comfortable and at the same time interactive. So these are some of the elements, what's called of deliberative democracy or deliberation that ultimately leads to some kind of more meaningful discussions that according to this theory are good for democracy, to lead us to make fact-based and, and, and thoughtful decision making. So I think it's very important for the, for the news organization to be mindful of being active, being part of these discussions. But also our research shows that sometimes it's also how you frame the questions that you have on social media 
how you frame these these topics on which you are reporting and then you are asking your audiences to comment on. That really makes a big difference. If you are framing an issue as a conflict, as a match, like a boxing match, then of course also the comments will be a bit more polarized. But if you if you report on an issue in a more in-depth kind of talking about causes and consequences and the potential solutions, talking about solutions is very important. And then this will also channel or I, I guess frame the discussions that happen under those. So it's, it's more, very important to be mindful of these issues. So we've been talking about Facebook and the use of social media, mm-hmm. and you have actually done some research into yeah. a very specific case of, of people commenting on, on a Facebook page. Yes, during the 2016 presidential elections. So basically what's happening is that during presidential debates, there is something called dual screen when people are uh, watching the debates, but at the same time engaging on social media to discuss the debates. So in this study, I was interested to see under which conditions these discussions were producing any kind of meaningful discussions on the broadcast broadcasters' Facebook pages. So in that particular study, I collected data from CNN, Fox News, ABC, and NBC, who were moderating one of the debates, the three debates. And we are measuring for different levels of their liberation there. And one of the things that this study suggested is that whenever in that first thread, the broadcasters would post something about a candidate discussing their own policies, discussing their own stance and record in terms of policy record, those would produce more meaningful discussions that were more rational, more interactive, and at the same time more civil than when they were posting a thread in which candidates were attacking each other. At the same time, we looked at the, we we compared these threads that were discussed in policy issues rather than candidate character, and again, also those those measures were showing that whenever these threads were discussing policy issues, the discussions again were more meaningful, more civil, more interactive, and provided more evidence. People who were discussing these issues than when they were talking about the character of the of the candidates, right? So this is very insightful for broadcasters. Like it goes to that first remark at earlier that it's important to be mindful how you frame the debate on social media, how you frame that thread you are starting up, right? Because the way it happens is that the broadcasters have a quote or a th- start a thread from the you know uh, c- candidates and then people comment under that. So it's very important to emphasize policy rather than attacks to each other. And we've seen a lot of time on these debates what, what really the disc- moderators focus on are, are attacks. You said this, but he said that, right? right? Always trying to create this kind of matching because it's entertaining, right? But uh, not necessarily as informative and also as impactful in, on, on the deliberative side of this that happens after the elections. When news media presents a story or an issue, there is tons of research that goes into that. The story has sources and and all of this information that covers whatever the issue may be. Mm -hmm. And then somebody comes and comments on that. This is somebody on the outside of the issue who's trying to comment mm-hmm. who who may think that they have all the facts. You know, they may say, oh, well, I know this. And, you know, they may give an sure. anecdotal story about something related to this, but maybe they're not being factual. Maybe they don't actually mm-hmm. know what they're talking about. How much value should we then place on public comments that don't fully understand what the issue is? Sure. And actually, there's I would argue there is the other side of this as well. There is some research that shows how lots of these comment sections sometimes can, can serve as corrections to the stories. Sure. Because, of course, if you think about this in the crowdsourcing approach, if you are one journalist working on a story, it's impossible for you to really interview everybody, right, so to speak, and get all the facts. And again, I'm trying to be here optimistic, finding the good side, the silver lining on this. And so there are cases when you are publishing a story, but then people who know more about this or they come in and correct the story. And lots of times these comments actually have led to corrections in the new story that has been published. And I think that's really the value. So it's like similar to, for example, those letters, sometimes those letters also corrected news stories, right? Your facts are wrong and corrections then were posted 
that a week later or I mean two weeks later, but now we have the technology to really do it in real time almost. And this is very, very important for the credibility of the news media. It's important to have a transparency process of how you collect the data and you are inclusive, but also it's important to really dis, uh, you know, show that you are listening to your, to your audiences and then taking in consideration as well their suggestions, especially when they make sense. And of course, there are cases when the facts maybe don't really, you know, whatever is, is provided is not, it's not true, but also be transparent, you know, engage. That's what I'm saying. Engage in conversation with those people and then say, well, we did extra investigation what you said. We couldn't find any, veri- any way to verify. So this way you validate your readers at the same time as create a transparency process, transparency in the way news is collected. And that really is very, very important for the news media in terms of building and maintaining that credibility, which now it's lacking. There's lots of problems with trust in news media. That's Lindita Samai, an associate professor of communication at the University of Houston. We spoke in 2019. Still to come, it's hard to imagine, but people used to live in Houston without air conditioning. The history of AC in the Bayou City as Houston Matters continues. A century ago in Houston, there was no air conditioning. It can be kind of hard to imagine living in a climate like this without it, but in 2015, our former producer Paige Phelps reported on the role AC played in shaping what the Houston area would become. Houstonians, August is looming. Just the thought of it makes one want to grab a kerchief, a fan, and a cool glass of lemonade. Or at least that's what Houstonians of the past would have done before air conditioning. It's too darn hot. It's too darn hot. It's too darn hot. These days, we'll just crank that machine down and create a comfortable ice box for as long as we want. But it doesn't change the fact that outside our doors is a humid swamp that is now a major metropolitan city, due in no small part to AC. One thing you really see when you start looking for it in the historic photos, even really upscale, fancy department stores like Sackowitz in the 20s and 30s, they just had oscillating fans. That, that was it. So even the elite in the city were hot. Heat and humidity was something that everybody shared in Houston. That was David Bush, Deputy Director for Preservation Houston. I brought him in to talk about how AC changed Houston architecturally, economically, and irreversibly. What are some of the plays that come to mind when you think of like a sultry southern play? Well, your most iconic is all that Tennessee Williams stuff. I mean, the play is called Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and Maggie is there, and she wants her beau brick to come show her some affection. And his response is pretty much, it's too hot, honey, it's too hot. And that was Jack Young, head of the professional actor training program at UH. I brought him in to help me imagine a time full of hot, sweaty, and if they're anything like I am when I can't cool down, cranky people, and how that was mirrored in theater and film. For instance... Well, Horton Foote, this plays are set in the outside areas, and people look at Houston as the big city, as a place that's very hot. And in Trip to Bountiful, the mom wants to go back to the quiet and the cool of the country instead of being in the heat of the city. You sure you're feeling all right? Yes, I am. Good night. Please, I want to go home. Mama, you know I can't make a living there. We have to live in Houston. No, son, I can't stay here any longer. I want to go home. I beg you not to ask me that again. A book, Energy, Metropolis, and Environmental History of Houston, has an entire chapter on air conditioning by Robert S. Thompson. He writes... Hot weather was necessary for cotton and rice, but the slow pace and traditional mores associated with the southern climate were a challenge for Houston's oil and commerce boosters. Commerce in Houston in the summer, in the Mm -hmm. 20s, 30s, and 40s, did it shut down? There's a Chamber of Commerce magazine, and if you haven't seen it, it's really great. David Bush again. And in the 20s and 30s and 40s, it talks about the midsummer slowdown in the economy. And so it it obviously had an effect. I mean, let's face it. The fact that Houston was ever heavily populated pre-AC is really a miracle. Never forget the founding Allen brothers, and I quote from the Houston Chronicle, trumped up a godforsaken pestilential swamp into the Texian promised land. We take air conditioning for granted, and you don't think it really needs to be explained that much 
or that you'd have to convince people that it's really a good thing living in Houston, that it would be cool in the summer instead of miserably humid and, and hot. You know who didn't take AC for granted? The Houston Chamber of Commerce. They launched an AC campaign to get more and more Houstonians to sign up for the newfangled service, hoping to expand the city. The Chamber of Commerce really cared about air conditioning. Every summer, there one of their magazine issues was just about air conditioning. I mean, the cover was about air conditioning. All the ads were about air conditioning. The articles were about air conditioning. And they were basic things like, what is air conditioning? Maybe it was because people didn't really understand what air conditioning was. Theaters were among the first buildings that were air conditioned. And it wasn't just movie theaters. It was vaudeville theaters as well. Although they weren't really air conditioned, they had something called air washing where there was a ventilation system and it would pump air through misty water and cool it and it would it would go out into the theaters. And in the summer, actually in the summer, most theaters closed because it was so hot. But some of them stayed open and they used ice in tubs and they would pump the air over ice in tubs. So it just doesn't sound pleasant. I mean, you, you've got Houston's humidity. And you're pumping either misty air or damp, cold air out out into the theaters. The Majestic and the Texan were the first two theaters in Houston that had real air conditioning, what we would call air conditioning. And that was 1923. Then by 1927, when the low state opened, they even had zoned air conditioning where it was a little bit cooler when you stepped into the lobby from the street. And then when you moved into the auditorium, it was the coolest of all. It was 78 degrees. That was considered the standard good temperature for a theater. That's how they were able to get people into the movie theaters. It wasn't come watch the movie. It was come sit in the cool of the dark of the afternoon. Jack Young. When you're usually sweltered and just hoping for any kind of shade at all, that's the, the great rise of the movie theaters themselves. Wouldn't have happened if there wasn't air conditioning. I know something to make you feel cool and fresh. Alcohol rub. Cologne. No thanks. We'd smell alike, like a couple of cats in the heat. But forget movie stars, forget Hollywood, forget theater that had people aching to be cool. Houstonians had always been searching for that. There's an ad for the Gulf Building, which is now the J.P. Morgan Chase Building. Tallest building in the city, 36 stories tall, was not air-conditioned when it was built, just had oscillating fans. But if you look at the rental ads, it talks about how if you've got an office up toward the top of the building, it's seven degrees cooler than it is on street level. And it's, it's all those little increments that they advertise. There's one for River Oaks in the 1930s. And River Oaks was slightly higher than downtown Houston. But if you read the ad, you'd think River Oaks was up in the mountains above the city because it's so cool and refreshing up there. The onset of AC meant more commerce, more money, more people, more Houston. It was fast. It really was. In 1938, 126 houses in Houston were air-conditioned out of a population of about 400,000. And then after the war, it just exploded. By the 50s, they were calling it the most air-conditioned city. And it wasn't something that was pejorative. It was they were proud of it. We're the most air-conditioned city in the world. I mean, that was, that was a big deal. And when you look at the Astrodome, I mean, it was as much the climate control as the enclosing the stadium that was the news. It was that you had an air-conditioned stadium. So even in the 60s, they're still focused on air conditioning. As wealthier Houstonians could now afford AC, they moved to the suburbs. They built new homes to better accommodate the technology. You can tell just driving around in Houston what the architecture looks like. If you've got a porch, that house was designed for somebody to sit out there and have the windows open on both sides. I live in a house that has windows that are parallel to each other so you can open up so you can get some breeze. But you look at some of these things that are going up now, that place has been made to be sealed up tight. Yet those old-fashioned homes with their generous porches made for excellent nostalgic scenery. Here's Jack again. The lack of uh, comforts of an air-conditioned style probably do precipitate all sorts of... Uh, tensions in the household. I think I'm going to fix, fix us a nice pitcher of lemonade. But you got no trouble. I'm going to fix it directly. I, I just feel kind of weak. I think it's too crowded. 
two of us on the swing. Would you do me a favor? Would you just, would you just sit down back over there? Why do you want me to move, Miss Mia? I think it's too much body heat. <laughs> two of us here together. All that heat and all that sinning that emanated from it was not lost on Houston's ministers. They readily acknowledged their city's history of vice, wrote Robert Thompson, but they promised that AC would end the decadence associated with Houston since its founding. Remember that when those first settlers came to Houston, they didn't find the cool Gulf breeze as they had been promised, but instead yellow fever, prostitution, and dueling. There is some things written that people would be able to sleep better, they'd be able to eat better, they'd eat more healthily, and just in general everything would be better because of air conditioning. It's the great utopia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who knew? Well, of the great anesthetizer. Jack Young. You know, takes away the smells, takes away the heat, shuts us away. You put AC plus a glowing box that brings us the instant entertainments that we need. We don't have to go connecting with people who disagree with us. We just get into a whole feedback loop of people who reinforce it, and all those other folks are somewhere else. In fact, today, the world without AC has fundamentally shifted. Think of all the contemporary TV settings that have elements of heat. You're in a, in a very strange world. And whether it's desert or whether it's swamp, there's a kind of mystic thing about that now that I think people are uh, walking in around. And yeah, they, subjecting you, yourself to outside elements that are unpleasant is yeah. otherworldly. Um, in True West, which is a Sam Shepard play and the two brothers, and it's in California, but one, one of the brothers is a bit of a menacing person because he lives out in the desert and he's come back inside and he doesn't recognize where he grew up anymore. And one brother says, one, brothers don't kill each other. What are you talking about? Family is always the people who kill each other, especially in the heat. You're my brother. This got nothing to do with it. You go down to the LA Police Department there, and you ask them what kind of people kill each other the most. What do you think? It's who said anything about killing? Family people. Brothers. Brothers-in-law. Cousins. Real American type people. Kill each other in the heat mostly. Why all the murder? Maybe it's because they're so hot? But I digress. Hey, you mind if I make myself comfortable? My shirt is sticking. Please, please do. Be comfortable. That's my motto, where I come from. It's mine, too. It's hard to stay looking fresh in hot weather. Why? Would this city be here without AC in the way that it is now? It probably wouldn't be as big. It, it's sort of like Phoenix in Las Vegas. Who would live... <laughs> in Phoenix and Las Vegas without air conditioning. On the other hand, New Orleans was really big early on, and it's got a climate more similar to Houston than, than Phoenix or Las Vegas, which are sort of the, the two they always use as an example. But it, it would be here, probably wouldn't be as big, probably not as many people from the north <laughs> would would tolerate it. On the other hand, if there's money and jobs, you put up with a lot. So, so there could be, you know, it could be. But unless there's a blackout, let's hope we never have to find out. For Houston Matters, I'm Paige Phelps. Former Houston Matters producer Paige Phelps first reported that story in 2015. The current Houston Matters team includes Michael Haggerty, Brenda Ruiz, and Troy Schultz. Jared Carroll is our technical director this week. I'm Joshua Zinn. Join us tomorrow for more Houston Matters. Houston Public Media.